staying <laughs> for the Q&A and for the end of the film. I hope you enjoyed it, or at least got something out of it that you can go home to think about. Uh, maybe see it again if, if you felt like that was a lot to take in in two hours and may want to mull over it a little and process. Uh, some of the panelists here we have, it, just for clarity, we all have very different opinions on these issues. Uh, so just every person is speaking for themselves and uh, we wanted diversity of ideology on this panel and so we have some men's rights activists, some feminists, people in the middle, and uh, I think we'll just have everyone introduce themselves. Thank you. Uh, my name is Lucinda Bray. I set up a theatre company a few years ago, working for and with anyone affected by sexual and domestic abuse. Um, Katie Went. I'm involved in all kinds of human rights activism, and I'm definitely trying to move the dialogue forward. I'm Cassie Jay, the filmmaker. Uh, Mike Buchanan, leader of the political party Justice for Men and Boys. The only political party in the English-speaking world campaigning for the human rights of men and boys on many fronts, and we have 17 of them on the uh, on, the, on the banner from our London conference. I'm Paul Elam. I'm the publisher and founder of A Voice for Men. I'm a men's human rights activist. I'm Erin Pitsy, and I opened the first refuge shelter in the world in 1971. And I'm David King. I'm tonight's moderator. Uh, but at the last minute, uh, I'm just briefly going to outline the um, format of tonight's discussion. But before I do, I wanted to thank the panelists and you as an audience together, because one of the most important things, at least in my mind, of this film is uh, to start a conversation. So we'll do that very shortly. Um, the way we're going to do this is uh, I'd like uh, to see at least two hands show up. Um, when they do, and um, we will bunny hop the microphones. We have two mic runners, and we will bunny hop the mic microphones from one to the other. So um, when the first person speaks, uh, the mic is on the way, the other one is on the way to the next uh, questioner, and then after the first person is finished, uh, I'll take another question and we'll bunny hop as uh, that goes. So, do we have any questions? Um, my question is for Cassie, if that's all right. Um, you identify as a feminist at the beginning of the film, um, and I saw the red pill as the kind of story of you building upon your beliefs as such, as a feminist. Um, I believe from the film that people can be feminists and part of the MRA, um, as they both focus on different issues. However, at the end, I was quite disheartened to hear that you no longer called yourself a feminist. Um, can you explain why? Uh, thank you for asking. Uh, so I, I didn't drop the label of feminist until two and a half years into making the film, so it was a very long journey. And uh, around the time that I dropped the label, I had just launched a Kickstarter campaign to try to raise finishing funds for post-production to complete the film. And uh, I was very upfront in my Kickstarter campaign that I wanted to make a film about the men's rights movement, but presenting varying perspectives, including the feminist uh, perspective in the film, and it would include my journey in making the film. And uh, But I, I was very upfront that I wanted to keep it balanced and fair. I wouldn't say it's unbiased, because I believe any filmmaker with making a documentary has bias. We all have our own life experiences and choose to what issues impact us the most or, or how to edit the film. So it's not unbiased, but I do believe it's balanced and fair to the people I interviewed, uh, not taking them out of context or trying to twist what they were saying to uh, manipulate the words. Uh, so when I launched that Kickstarter campaign, uh, I didn't initially receive a lot of support. There were some people that knew about the film that gave some money, but we were, I don't know the exact percentage, but we were probably less than 20% funded halfway through the campaign. and. Uh, and then we had a write-up in Breitbart, which is obviously a very controversial publication, but uh, Milo Yiannopoulos wrote about the struggle to complete this film with all the film grants that I was denied and 
and uh, how I had people working with me who would uh, get so triggered to the point of having to step out and uh, collect themselves and eventually would leave the project. Um, so he wrote about that and that's when we had a, a flood of free speech activists and anti-censorship crusaders go to the Kickstarter and uh, take us over the goal amount of $97,000 and actually we ended at $211,000 that we raised on Kickstarter. And once the film, the project started getting that success on Kickstarter, I started being, uh, my reputation was smeared by feminist media and writers and bloggers, journalists, and even my uh, personal friends and family who knew about the film. Uh, some of them still refused to watch the film. I lost a few friends along the way. And I, I was just really, I mean, the film wasn't even completed yet, so no one knew how it was gonna turn out. They didn't know that I ended up dropping the label, but it was actually that whole process of realizing that uh, the most backlash I received was from feminists not wanting to see a, a film that talks about men's issues. And when I would talk to feminists about, uh, or ask them about the men's rights movement or uh, interview them for this film, none of them could name men's issues. And I became a feminist when I was in my late teens, around 18, 19 years old, I'm now 30. Uh, but I became a feminist because I believed it was the movement for gender equality. And I started to realize that it really is just focused on women's issues and sometimes to the point of stepping over and, and even harming uh, men in the process. And so that's ultimately why I dropped the label, but I, it was a very long process to come to that point and in no way, shape, or form am I making this film to try to tell you what to do with your label or how, uh, how you want to define yourself or what movements you want to be a part of but that was just where I ended up, and I thought I should share that in the film since you already saw most of my journey, so it sounded best to wrap it up with saying where I ended. You've actually answered a number of questions that a lot of people have actually asked online in what you've just explained there, which is great. Um, but something you said in the film where you, you turn the lens on the feminists, um, I wanted to just ask a brief question. Did you have, uh, when you started ringing up feminists and saying, you know, do you have an opinion on this, can I visit you, can I interview you, did you get me returning you down? Yes, I was actually in contact with Gloria Steinem while filming, and she said, I asked her for an interview, and see, she declined and said that she didn't know enough about the men's rights movement to speak on it. So she referred me to Michael Kimmel, who is one of uh, the feminists included in the film, and he's actually uh, touted as, as the feminist to go to when addressing men's issues within feminism. And uh, so that's why he's included in the film, and, and he's a, a very prominent feminist, at least in the U.S. This lady here. Thank you. Um, my question is for Paul. Um, from my personal experience at university, I find that the discussion comes, or the lack of it rather, comes from people being unable to hold two ideas in their minds simultaneously. It, it happened during Brexit as well. People were like, you're either a liberal elitist or you're a racist bigot and there's no room for anywhere in between. And that seems more prominent in, I would say, 25 and under demographic. And I was wondering where you think that might stem from? Well, well if I'm getting your question correctly, I, I think dogma is the problem. And it's, I wouldn't necessarily say it's confined to a younger demographic. Uh, it can, it's across the board. Uh, we have the same problem in some elements. I think it's a, a little bit better, but we have s the same problem in some elements of the men's movement, that there becomes an entrenched dogma, sometimes in a small group that, that really think that women are the enemy, uh, that think that uh, gynocentrism is the ultimate evil in the world and is going to destroy us all. And when people get locked into that, some people, I just think, there's a percentage of the population that needs very, very concrete, solid ideas, black and white, um, something they can, they can grab hold of and believe in. And they do have a, a tremendous problem being flexible. I think that that problem got documented very well in this movie. Uh, and I think it's uh, certainly something I've seen evidenced in my work over the years of, as a men's advocate, coming up against feminists that have absolutely concrete ideas 
about what is true and what is not true to the point that you can put a stack of evidence in front of them and they will totally disregard it. So I think that zealotry, just like Sage Gerard mentioned in the film, zealotry and dogma uh, is the problem. Karen Strawn also referenced it in comparing sometimes some levels of feminist belief to a religious philosophy. Uh, that's what it boils down to. And as you know, you know, if you, if you talk to somebody that's deeply religious about anything that, that is contradictory to their religious ideals, it's automatically blasphemy. Um, and that's what these discussions start to feel like. It's one of the reasons that I'm thankful that we have feminists at this table who are engaging in a dialogue with us and not just sitting here throwing rocks back and forth. I think that's a great start. I hope I've answered your question. Jonathan Hyde would have also something to say about the blasphemy from an uh, aspect of that. Uh, this lady here, and then uh, the person at the back there. Hello, um, that's an interesting slide that, you, that you're having over the top of your panel discussion, because there's absolutely no context to those percentages. Combat deaths, 99.9% .9 are male, simply because women are very, very rarely in the front line of combat. Work deaths, 19.4% are male, probably because most of the workforce is male and most the oil rig jobs and things like that, sorry, the, the dangerous jobs are mostly male. If you think about the oil rig jobs, they are mostly male. So the high, the high um, level construction, they will be mostly male. I think notwithstanding Sorry. The context, I think, for statistics on both sides, as you rightly pointed out, the statistics for violence, um, the male versus female statistics, I think without context, they can be spun either way. And I was wondering how they can be productively used to support your your play, sorry, your, your, for, your um, forum without the necessary context. Sorry, is that, is that explained properly? You've got... To be honest, I'm not sure if I'm okay. sure about your question. Um, can I... Can I in, so yes, yeah, please. I think, well, and correct me if I'm wrong, I think the question is, if, if statistics are going to be produced and shown in such a raw way, in such a blunt way, without the context of them. Um, are they as useful to the argument, or do they not... You mean like one in five women will be sexually assaulted? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. I'm like saying that. both sides. I, I, she, I think there is that kind of sense of some of these statistics aren't helpful and are manipulatable because they're provided without context, and some of the other statistics that are provided about the violence. Well, I have to ask. Let's, let's, let's take a look at it. We've got at the top there, combat deaths, 99.9% .9 male. <clears throat> that is an accurate number. Yes, absolutely. So but what context not... can we provide to sh shine any more light? Uh, because you have, you have the context of how many male to female, how many in the services what is the balance between male and female service personnel? Well, yeah, that's, what is the balance and the context the point between front line? <laughs> when front you've got line. all male conscription, no, when no, you no, have no, no, well, no, we don't have that well, here. We don't have cons well. Oh, this you, is this is this is in America. This sign is in America. Also, okay, that's fine. That's in America. But okay, ma'am, you asked a question. Will you let me answer? May I just make one final point? Is that <laughs> Is what is the percentage, if you know, of frontline service personnel, male versus female? I don't have that statistic at all in front of me, and so I won't try to BS my way through an answer. But what I will but say that's the context. is that historically, uh, all the way across the board, including the wars that have been waged out of this country, conscription was a way to put people. This is a historical context, and that role was put on men. 
context is an extremely complicated matter, and yeah. we spend a great deal of amount of time. We might come back to that if if uh, if we have time. Well, I want to make sure we've answered to our satisfaction. Maybe one of the feminists on the board yeah, would I, like I, to, I, to, to give a bit of statistics. <laughs> Yeah, to my shame, I have a degree in statistics, uh, amongst other past studies, uh, and we did briefly discuss this at the end of the film, um, because I tend to go and research statistics immediately after I see them, uh, and not everyone does, which is why we had Brexit, because nobody went and researched the 350 million goes to the NHS if we pull out of Europe, that kind of thing. Um, that's off the point, but the, and I do work with domestic abuse, sexual violence charities, getting them to acknowledge violence towards men and violence towards trans, because in fact, Domestic violence, I think was mentioned on the panel yesterday, affects one in two trans people. Um, but, where, yeah, you do need to look behind stats. I don't think there's anything, personally, and I'm saying this in, in your support, I don't think there's anything wrong in putting those stats up because women put up similar stats, trans people put up similar stats, like the stats about trans suicides. We all use stats in very, very simplistic ways, and that goes back to what you were saying earlier about the, the dogmatic ideological aspects and what um, you were saying earlier about people looking for simple answers. And in all political campaigns, we chuck out simple slogans or simple stats. Um, so I, th I don't think that, I think it's, I think it's not even handed to, uh, say, accuse the MRA of using stats badly, because everybody uses stats badly, and I think they use stats the same way everyone else does. But if you were to put, you know, kind of legal small print at the bottom of that, explaining the context of every stat, it would run to reams and reams and reams of paper. I'll chuck in two examples of, say, of the domestic abuse stat difference. Um, one is the, the fact that when you look at the men as victims, a third of the perpetrators of men as victims were other men in same-sex violence situations, a third were women who had been abused, and a third were heterosexual women who were aggressors and hadn't been abused anyway. That's just one particular analysis of a stat there. You could do the same taking apart the women as victims stat, and in fact in one particular year in 2009, um, as a woman, you are three times more likely to be abused by a woman in a lesbian relationship than by a man in a heterosexual relationship, taking apart another stat. So all of those things make for different readings. The male suicide stat, and this isn't necessarily an answer to it, it's still a shocking stat, absolutely. Less men attempt suicide, but sadly they're better at it. Thank you. Um, right. I have the microphone so I'll speak. Thank you. Just to put myself in context, I'm a sociologist, anthropologist, and I would say that I've been teaching these kind of statistics and this kind of information for 25 years. So none of this is a surprise to me. Um, what I'd like to put to the panel is that my personal feeling that has not been supported particularly by evidence is that young people, particularly young men today, are particularly vulnerable. So that for today's young men, there is no clear model of what it means to be a man anymore, as there was for previous generations. There's no clear idea of what they should do in terms of work or how they carry out their roles. And they are more vulnerable than any previous generation to accusations, false or true, of rape or sexual misbehaviour? Um, I'm more than happy to start the conversation on that. Um, I think that you raised an awful lot of points there, um, and some of which I really strongly agree with. Having worked at City College for in Norwich for five years, um, across courses with males and females, I would certainly agree that young men are intensely vulnerable and are lacking the support to express their emotions um, and thus this is causing them to turn in on themselves. Um, I think there are some interesting points that you make about um, what it is to be a man and masculinity and sadly that wasn't something that really came up in the panel yesterday but um, Grace and Perry's done some re a really interesting book called The Descent of Man um, which talks about this in a lot of detail, uh, raising issues for what is the modern man and how, how are young men supposed to behave and how are 
how are they supposed to develop a sense of manliness? What is that? And it's down to, as, as a theatre practitioner, it's partly, and I'm, I don't know how Cassie feels about this as a filmmaker, but it's partly down to the creative industries who pump out so much information about what it is to be a woman, what it is to be a man. Um, you know, soap operas in this country are so hugely influential. YouTube soaps, like all of these media sources plunging information into young people. Yet I don't see the narratives of a lot of the young people that I know. And I, I'm proud to say that one of my students, I think he's run away now, to be fair, um, came this evening because he was interested and he wanted to know. And, and I'm acutely aware that some of the things you're saying are quite right. Uh, the one thing that I would question is the, the final point you made about the likelihood of, uh, or the, their vulnerability to accusations of rape, I think that's, a, and sexual abuse. I think that's a really complicated thing that is, we do not educate well enough in schools to girls and boys what is what is a healthy relationship? How do you ask for consent? It's one thing to tell somebody to put on a condom. How do you say, can you put a condom on, please? Like, how, are we having those conversations with our young people in schools? Sadly, mostly not. And that is what leaves both genders acutely vulnerable. I've talked quite a lot. I will pass on. I'd just like to make a point about um, educational um, well, the, the educational failure of males, quite frankly, and the, the gender education gap um, at, at, I guess, at, at high schools can be traced back very directly to uh, the academic year 1987-88, so call it 30 years ago, um, with the replacement of O-levels by GCSEs, which included a number of things, including continuous assessment, and that was brought in, uh, for, that was brought in for the reasons of, of uh, giving free reign to uh, both male and female teacher bias towards girls. And there's a very good, very good article by, by William Collins, who's an, uh, who's an outstanding blogger. And he shows, he shows graphically that the, that the education gender gap started in that year, and it's been with, with us ever since. And we have, we have today a situation where the most disadvantaged group of boys are white working class boys. We have the Department of Education, who we know from the Freedom of Information response, do not uh, I have no interest in the matter, and to compound it, the Education Secretary is the Minister for Women and Equalities. Men, you know, what, what, what are we saying that, 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 that these, that these young men, these boys should talk about their feelings? They are being disadvantaged deliberately by the education system, and they have been for 30 damn years. Um, I think there's some really interesting points there about our education system and certainly the change towards continuous formative assessment um, does, does play to the strengths of girls and it was designed for that because previously up until that point our education system didn't allow young women to thrive and it is quite likely it is quite likely it has gone the other way and there is absolute moves in the changes in the GCSEs and the move back towards we no longer have formative assessment we have moved back towards GCSE English and maths being assessed at the end by exams as of this year so it has now moved back the other way now hopefully the teachers of this country will um, step up to the plate and work to the diversity of their classrooms, which includes the racial diversity. And I, you know, there is a problem there as well where we don't necessarily, you know, black boys are much likely to be put in detention than, than white boys in some schools in some cases. So it's a very complex issue, but it's unfair to say the Department of Education haven't paid any attention to this because actually we have changed our entire structure back to what it was before. But that's, I've been asked to keep it short, so I assume that is. I would, I'd like to add just one more thought to this, and then we can hopefully move on back to the questions from the audience. Um, but I just want to go back uh, to what, what this lady said. Yes, um, our boys are in crisis like never before. They really are. Uh, they are what I call a lost generation, almost like the, the walking wounded. Uh, we have so many young men coming from single mother homes 
We have so many young men who have had masculine influence removed from their lives. I mean, one of the, the questions is, where do they get an idea about what manhood is? Well, with, with coming from a single mother home and going through the first four, five, six years of education with almost no men in their experience, they don't get any kind of role modeling at all. We have all but eliminated the tradition of mentoring in, in this culture. We don't have mentors for young men like we used to. And then we turn, I think, perhaps with the best intention in the world to saying, okay, part of what young men need is to be told that it's okay to express their feelings. But I've got really strong concerns about relying on this as some sort of antidote. One, there is, and I can tell you with 30 years in the mental health field, there is a devastating ignorance of men's psychology in the mental health field across the Western world. Absolute, devastating ignorance. And we turn to alternatives to say, well, um, let's make boys more like girls. Let's tell them, express your feelings. And I don't deny the wisdom of allowing boys more latitude to express feelings in life. I don't deny the importance of that at all, and I think that's always been a deficit. But what we've done is, is turn this into a reverence for the state of feelings that boys don't relate to, because men tend to deal with loss, with grief, with all sorts of things in life, adversity, much more so by action than by articulating feelings. That is a more masculine nature. That's what they tend to do. And so by reverting to this female model uh, of mental health, we end up telling them, be more like women and do something that really in the long run doesn't work for most men. It may work for some. But I think our solutions go back to reintroducing masculine influence in the lives of boys that that's where we start, and I think that's probably the only place we're gonna find an answer. I think, I think, I think one last point of reply, and then um, I think there was a question at the far left back, and then this gentleman uh, on the right here. Um, yeah, two things on that. One thing you said on the panel yesterday, I, th I think it was you, Paul. Yeah, it was you, actually, because um, I make a noise. Um, <laughs> um, you said we need to listen to men where they're at, including their anger. And there's someone in the who was somebody else in the room last night who kind of reminded me of that at the end and was so pleased I've made total notes about that. Um, because I think that is true as well. And that reminds me of the, the book that came out some years ago, that, you know, The Languages of Love. You know, and like the idea that people express love in different ways. And my own parents, I have to try and remind them and persuade them sometimes that they both do love each other, but they express it in completely different ways. My father says, I want to provide financial security for your mother, but you know, I don't do, I can't do hugs and I can't do communication. My mother says, oh, I wish your father would just talk to me. And then she does so many things for him in different ways to express her love. And it's blatantly obvious that after 54 years of marriage, they love each other to bits, but they express it in worlds apart ways. And I'm not going to go down the Mars Venus line because as a trans person, I think fuck Mars Venus. But um, sorry. Um, <laughs> um, but there are, particularly because of the whole gender roles issue, etc., and the gendered raised lives that we experience, it is partly true. But it doesn't have to be. Right. Um, there was the next question was at the back there. The lady. Did you still have a question? No? Okay, in that case, uh, the, the, this one over here. Hello. Um, I had some questions for Paul. Over here. I'm right into the... Oh, All right. right. <laughs> the lights um, make a really hard. Yeah, so... Uh, sorry, just gathering my thoughts from all the other questions that we've had. Um, I was thinking in terms of, like, partly the statistics and context what we think problems are from your perspective, because I know a lot about the feminist perspective and solutions, and what is it that you think going forward, what would you, what would you like to see, like what actions would you like to take in solving these things, so like if we're talking about combat and work death and suicides, and we're also talking about lack of male role models for young boys in the current generation, what is it 
do you think that would be the most important thing to focus on going forward to provide a more equal a more equal balance of things or something that is a brighter future? I don't think equality is achievable in the true sense. I mean, one, there's no two human beings are equal to each other, much less two separate dimorphic groups um, within one species. What I would like to see is simple. I mean, I don't think we're ever going to substantially change all these numbers. I mean, I, we may impact them. What I would like to see is really simple. I would like to see men and women equally value each other. I would like to see men and women respect the experiences of the other and to offer support that is not trying to change the other one. Uh, our biggest beef with feminism is that it's trying to make men something that they're not and trying to shame them for failing to comply and persecuting them. I mean, I remind everybody here, we're in a secret meeting. We had to sneak in here tonight while the authorities weren't looking. I'd like to see that change. I'd like to see a lot of things change. But do I want to see half of the body bags coming back from a war zone filled with female bodies? No. I don't think that's an ambitious goal. I'd like to see no body bags from no wars. I'd like to see men nor women killing themselves. Uh, but I think where we've gone furthest off track is that we just don't respect each other anymore. And I don't think we're gonna begin getting that respect. I think men, quite honestly, in this culture today, need to stand up and demand that respect. Was there a question? Okay. <clears throat> Hi there. Um, I guess I'm uh, conflating a lot of different points that have been articulated so far, but um, I am a uh, survivor of suicide. I've attempted it twice. Obviously, I'm not that good at it because I'm still here, thankfully. Um, I also transitioned, obviously, there and back. And uh, the reason for that was because I had undiagnosed mental illness and no one saw it. I was invisible. And uh, I have to look at the scars of that, of how deeply I internalized female value to the point where I took drugs that I bought online to change myself around just to try and not feel like a worthless piece of trash. And uh, I have to live with that every day, but I have discovered a new sense of masculinity, and um, it, I think masculinity is rooted in intellectual honesty, and that's what I think we're all here for. And I suppose my question to anyone who wants to build it is, how do we reinstitutionalize intellectual honesty? Because so many people, and it was abundantly clear in the film, were just not interested. They wanted to maintain their bubble, their way, and there were no brakes on that train. Well, you've had a real journey to actually come to, to know how valuable your life is and to find a truth. And my feeling, first of all, I want to say something about uh, suicides in general. In the refuge, the majority of women had attempted suicide at one time or another, but largely they were cry for help. Men are different. When men kill themselves, on the whole, they manage to your life was spared and hopefully for you you know i don't think i'm the right person to talk to you on this i think you are probably you yeah, yeah. um i'm trans um not happy with it no um i was diagnosed as the um most reluctant transsexual my psychiatrist had ever met um so I spent a long time trying to work out what I wanted to do with that. And as you can see by the fact that I don't modulate my voice, I don't attempt to pass as anyone except me, except myself. And I'm also not into, oh, I've got, we are being what's sort of being reported, I get in trouble with the trans people as well. Um, uh, trans people very often can be in denial. Um, and there's again an ideological blockade of people who do detransition. 
it does exist. There are people who are dissatisfied with it. It is a minority. There are also, as you say, um, undiagnosed mental health issues that pass the by. And I question myself actually throughout all my um, repressed, you know, um, not coming out as trans. Um, in fact, I never came out as trans. My ex-wife outed me. Um, she was a psychiatrist. <laughs> <laughs> and a Christian. Um, but the during that whole period, uh, I questioned every aspect of like, you know, do I am, do I want to be a woman? Do I not want to be a man? Um, whatever it is that I'm doing, am I doing it because I don't feel like I fit? the standards for masculinity that are set out there and that are respected of men by men. But, because I went to an all-boys school, I spent three years in the army cadets, and yeah, there was an expectation for how to be a man. I, because of some intersex conditions, I had very, very severely delayed puberty and inadequate puberty, which meant it was very hard to be a man in the rugby showers with everyone else when you hadn't developed um, and your voice didn't break at the university. <laughs> um, but the, I also experienced it coming from women in my life, saying, be a man type stuff, and um, being told uh, to go out and get a better job so you can support me. So, kind of, yeah, oddly on this panel, I've been a man, tried to be a woman, now decided to be me. But as a result, I do have some skewed, but they're very personal perspectives, but I, that's why I'm a, um, an activist for all genders in that sense, and I'm also absolutely with you on intellectual honesty, and it doesn't even have to be intellectual in that sense, but just honesty, and so many people aren't um, about so many of these things, which is why I'm passionate and very pleased to be on this panel. And I've tried suicide as well, and I'm also shit at it. <laughs> I don't know if you want to move on. I've got a tiny thing to add. Yeah. Too many mics. Um, I really appreciate your question about intellectual honesty. Um, I have been, there is someone in this room actually that is exceptionally good on calling me out when I'm maybe being a little bit too emotive. And emotions are very, very good, they're helpful, they're wonderful. But sometimes we need to recognise when it's our emotions that are possibly attached to our personal experience rather than actually looking at something quite factually and that has a lot of benefit as well and I think it's about encouraging people to ask the question why? Why am I reacting like that? Why do I have such a strong feeling about that? What is that feeling? And constantly Ask, I would encourage every person in here, whenever they have a really strong emotive response to something, just ask yourself why. And I hope that answers your question a little bit. I'd just like to make a point about feminism and lying, because those two things really come together. Uh, we, we have, for the last uh, three years, been presenting Lying Feminist of the Month Awards on top of our Gormless Feminist of the Month Awards and Toxic and why, and not once, uh, I'm not aware of an, an incidence where lying feminists have ever retracted their lies, let alone apologised for them. And, you know, month after month, I mean, Caroline Criado Perez has three of them, Laura Bates has a couple, the, the leader and the spokeswoman for the Women's Equality Party have each got two or three lying feminists of the Month Awards, and they, they, they don't deny that they lied that they, they, they're not held accountable by the mainstream media. And I say in the last 40, I mean, has any feminist ever, I mean, there's just so much data, evidence of feminist lying, particularly on area, I mean, domestic violence is probably the worst area. And, uh, you know, feminism is based upon lies. Wherever you look, feminists lie. I want to add some, I'm out of the league of the intellectual honesty. I think that's been addressed. One of the ways that males are most controlled in this culture and even within their families is with shame. It is like, especially for men, it's a ton of bricks on the back. If they don't measure up as men, if they don't produce enough, uh, if they're not making a woman smile, if they're not being a real man, whatever that is. And I believe a lot of men kill themselves over 
dysfunctionally applied shame. They get it from their families, they get it from the culture around them. Uh, a lot of times you see men suicide after losing a job, feeling they can't provide for their families, or feeling like they, they don't measure up. Uh, sometimes just even if they're financially okay, but their marriage ends, the feeling of failure. And one of the worst things we do is feed men a sense of failure for not measuring up to an ideal of masculinity that is absolutely outrageously incorrect. Um, and I don't know if that applies to your life. All I know is that usually when men kill themselves, many, many times you can go back and find shame at the root. And just want to say, just in general, you or anybody else, that shame belongs with somebody else, not you. Suicide is such an important topic. I would really like to continue this line of uh, discussion a bit further, but the questions are beginning to mount up. So I'd like to take uh, the person at the uh, back on uh, the right, up, is up there, um, then uh, the lady in the front here, and uh, the gentleman here who's been waiting very patiently. Well, okay. Uh, those those three or four, please. Uh, next. The, the back there. No? Okay. The, uh, this, uh, yes. Uh, this one is uh, addressed to the panel in general. Um, do you think the tone of the dialogue or discourse surrounding gender issues has uh, changed substantially in the online era? Sorry, I'm a bit quiet. Yes, yeah. I do. Speak up a little. I do. The most important thing I discovered <laughs> when I finally got online was that actually that's where all the men were. That's it. That's that's the online. That's what actually made the men's movement so powerful, because of the feeling of shame when men criticise women is so big that very few men will actually say anything in public, and it, it's it's amazing how many of you, uh, men that came tonight. Because mostly men really don't get together over emotional issues to do with their lives. And then suddenly there were the, all these men's groups. And I just think the internet has an enormous part to play in how men can communicate with each other safely. Let's, let's have. I think, yeah, I'd absolutely agree with the idea that it's changed how we talk about gender and what we see gender as and the discourse. And, and it is really interesting that men do seem much happier conversing via chat rooms and things like that. And when we were talking earlier about um, expressing feelings, it, it, those things don't always have to look the same way. And actually, from what I've read of those, there's a lot of feelings being expressed right there, but in a very different way to traditional talking therapies, and there is room for that. I think there is also a danger um, that we can get wrapped up in our own narratives and our own dialogues and we become very very much this is me and this is my life and this is my experience and sometimes i think both men and women feminists and i would imagine mras are guilty of of suppressing other people's narratives so i think it is changing the discourse i think and that's inherently a good thing um, but we do need to be a bit careful and think about ways we can manage that where it's productive in the long term. I want to add, I've got to. <laughs> MRAs do not suppress anyone's narrative uh, anywhere that I've ever seen. We welcome this. I flew from Texas to can come I? to the, let me, yeah. let me finish. And there's a difference in the expressive environment. Now imagine a young man getting up in a college classroom on any campus right now and saying, I don't believe feminism has it right. I think it's wrong. I think it's abusive toward men. I talk to those young men. They get persecuted. You want to know why there's so much expression online from men? It's because when they express it in real life, they pay a price for it. 
when they stand up and support feminism, they're lauded, they're appreciated, they're welcomed, they're part of the status quo. But when they stand up and talk about men's issues in the way we talk about them, they get a knife right through the gut. And that is reality. I, I think I just want to qualify what I mean by suppression rather than oppression. I just mean that sometimes when we hear what somebody else is going through, we feel that we are unable to speak out. So sometimes when, and I think Cassie covers it quite well in the film, that sense of, um, oh, well, these men are talking about this, and I feel the need to put women's points of view across. That's all I meant. I didn't mean that what you're quite rightly articulating is that kind of, no, you cannot say that. I think actually the online presence is really good for allowing all of that, but there's a danger in that. Um, I would also like to add to your point that you've just made about men standing up and saying, you know, this is happening to me, this is my issue. And um, I think there's, I was talking with my ex-student on the way here about the course that he used to be on which was traditionally a male-dominated course, uh, technical theatre, which is traditionally a male-dominated profession. And his course leader, who is a guy, has worked really hard to make it more equal, allowing more uh, women into that profession, which is great. But one thing I noticed just before I took my sabbatical is that there was a tendency for some of the girls to be like, oh, God, the boys are so stupid. I mean, like, we'll just have to come in and sort everything out. And I was like, actually, that's not okay either. We can't, and you know, oh, I'd, and the boys would come in and be like, oh, I'll do that for you, and then get shouted down sometimes. So there is that need of constantly, as the gentleman um, pointed out earlier, the need for that intellectual questioning. Why, why do you think that's okay? And, and I think it's really important that we do move to give boys space to articulate what is going on for them. Okay, the gentleman here next, and after this lady, please. Hi there. Um, my question concerns, or it's basically from the viewpoint of a uh, young male growing up in the kind of society that most Western countries have adopted. And um, it's, all, it's all very well to be a political activist, to be um, against injustices and laws that are biased against men. But to some extent, you still have to grow up under those laws, you still have to live under them. And for a MGTOW style male, it might be easy to um, withdraw from romantic life or from family life and avoid it because, let's be honest, a lot of people believe it's a minefield, and it is to an extent. But the question I'm posing to uh, the panel, I guess, is how would you advise a young male in today's society to actually navigate um, a lot of the areas which are biased against men, basically? Everybody's frozen. Uh, well, it's a MGTOW. For anybody that doesn't know what MGTOW is, it's an acronym for men going their own way. Um, and that is something to some degree or another that I think is a viable option for men. I do not recommend to any young man to get married legally. Cannot recommend it. The courts are just as biased as they talked about in the movie. It is a minefield, and it is something that now, and Helen, Dr. Helen Smith documented this in her book, Men on Strife, the roles have reversed in a strange way, gender-wise. It used to be that a lot more men were interested in marriage than women, by numbers. Um, that's flipped. The, number, the numbers of men who are interested in marriage has dropped radically in the past 20 years, and it's continuing to drop. And that is a reflection of collective wisdom. Um, I would like to see the family, co family courts uh, reformed. I would like to see laws changed. So mainly so that our courtrooms, our family courts, aren't destroying the children get caught in the legal crossfire because that's what's happening right now. Uh, but in the meantime, in the interim, I can't suggest that any young man get involved in a legal contract that in effect, and I've said this many times before, you're not marrying a woman, you're marrying the state. And even after the woman's gone, the state will remain and will be in parts of your anatomy that you don't want it. Um, 
as far as anything else in life, be careful. You know, again, a lot of the issues came up tonight, false allegations, things like that. I'd say use your wisdom, be careful. One of the worst mistakes that men make, and this is a feminist criticism of men that I agree with totally, is that they assess women sexually, and then that's all that matters. End of story. Men are not trained to, and that does not occur to them on their own when they're in their 20s and the hormones are raging. They do not assess women on their character. They, not, they don't assess women. They decide, am I attracted to this? And if I'm attracted to this, then I'm going to do whatever it takes to get up on that. Um, and that's how we get some problems. <laughs> and that's how a lot of men set themselves up for disaster. Um, again, what I talk about in my work, I call a values-based approach for men. Men identifying their values and then proceeding with integrity to guard those values and to live by them. Even if it means you've got to tell yourself no to little red hot Mary. Um, but that's all I can suggest. Stay away from the law <laughs> and think with the head that's up here. <laughs> yeah, you make some really interesting, solid points there. Um, I would also add to that, uh, the only, um, hmm, sorry, I'm not being very articulate right now. Um, do, do get married if your partner's about to die because then the state will take everything from you anyway. Um, I, I know this because I'm a person that was bereaved at a young age and was brought up by my father who um, managed very, very laudably but did have allegations put against him by people who had nothing to do with our family and we had social services round and all sorts of fun things like that just because he was a man. So I very much appreciate that there is a, a bias against men. But I would really encourage you to people watch. If you want to avoid, if you want to get through the hell that is dating, and it is hell, it's hell for all, um, but in different and unique and dastardly ways. Um, pay attention to people and work out, like you say, work out what it is you want in a person and be honest about that and work out. I had a conversation with a, a young male friend the other day who's with somebody that he's realized is probably going to be quite toxic. And he was like, well, I don't think I can break up with them because then I'll, then I'll be an asshole. Excuse my language. And, and I was like, mm, no, no, not if that's not right for you, then it's not gonna be right for her anyway. Just be honest with yourself and, and have conversations with people and people watch so you can work out what looks good and what doesn't. Cassie, I think you were going to... Uh, so after making this film, I have thought that it'd be so interesting to have a film about what millennial men face. And this film, I did go to the experts, the people who wrote the books, the people who've been around for a while and are considered the leaders of the men's rights movement or feminism. And so that's why you see a lot of older people in the film. Uh, and absolutely not to say that their <laughs> experiences and thoughts don't matter just because they're older generations. Obviously, we should really consider what they have to say because they've been around a lot longer and seen a lot. Uh, but I also think millennial men, uh, I think their voices should be heard too. And I would love to see a film about that. I don't, I don't know if I'm the one to make it, but if anyone out there wants to <laughs> do it themselves or inspire someone else to, please do. And so to speak to the, the MGTOW young man, um, I actually think what needs to happen for young men who who are MGTOWs and are not wanting to get married, I don't think necessarily you guys need to change. I think, and this is gonna sound a little harsh, but I think women need to wake up. And uh, I can't find a way, to, I don't know a better way to put that that doesn't sound you know rude or offensive to say, but I, I really do feel like I woke up when making this film and my six year long relationship with my boyfriend has changed immensely for the better. And the first two years of our dating before I made the red pill, uh, it, I did create a toxic environment at home. I, I usually routinely one time a month 
intense, I would uh, find it something to argue about and, and make him afraid to be in the same room as me and tr make him try to avoid me. And usually I was complaining about uh, work stress and, and blaming it on being a woman in the workforce and would also complain about housework. And because he never complained, I thought he had nothing to complain about. But now making the, the film, I know men do have things to complain about and I, also to kind of piggyback off of the conversation about should men express their feelings more often. Uh, I think, and this is obviously gonna generalize, but women are more feeling and I, and I think that's a great thing and men are more thinking or logical, pragmatic, wanting to find solutions rather than just share their feelings. And so even though men have all these issues, if you asked him, how are you doing, how are you feeling? Uh, they wouldn't bring up all these issues because they're not feeling these issues. They just know these are men's issues they have to deal with. They are the, the breadwinner, the success object. They have to go to work at extremely long hours, sometimes taking on dangerous jobs because it pays better. And uh, so if women can wake up to these issues, then I think that will create healthier relationships for everyone. Uh, to, because maybe men aren't going to speak up for themselves. They don't want to bring the family down with, with things to complain about. And um, so I think we just need to share the issues and have, hopefully have young women start to understand what men deal with and have more compassion for men. And then hopefully there will be a better uh, pool of, of women to date for millennial men uh, with compassion. Uh, I don't know. That's my thoughts. <laughs> I'm not sure I entirely agree with the proposition that men don't feel. <laughs> um, we may express ourselves differently, but that's not the same thing. The lady in the front here. Uh, this is something which uh, I have been interested in pretty well all my life, the relationship between men and women and how we, how we appreciate each other. <clears throat> I was somewhat depressed by the amount of adversarial, uh, combative uh, nature that was expressed in the film. Now, I was given away at birth because there was no one to support me. My mother had been impregnated by a Canadian GI, and so I was given away. And when men and women come together, there are children involved. And so this binary attitude and the upsetting nature of men's feelings towards some women and some women's feelings towards some men is, is not going to, to go away unless we all, both genders, plead for greater tolerance and understanding. And I would like each of the panel to address that. If I start just because that one's being passed down, I'll try and keep it short. I, I agree, I think we express our feelings in very different ways and we have to learn to work out what that is. I think one of the things I wrote down was, Cassie was speaking before, um, is about expressing your feelings and, and actually we need to learn to ask questions better. Uh, as I've been trained as a teacher, I've got better at ask, asking questions, the right questions. And I think it's a lot about that, learning to ask the right questions of one another and how to put those questions in a respectful and fair manner. Okay. Um, this is kind of the, quite a, I presume we're heading towards the end anyway. And it's quite a good question to be getting to. And it's a bit like yesterday, 